Well, all joking aside, God has called men to be men. But ladies, he's also called you to stand as well. And I want to read a very famous passage of Scripture today, and we're going to break it down for you that I think will be very, very helpful for all of us to learn how to biblically stand the way God has called us to stand. It's found in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. And the Apostle Paul wrote this, and he actually uh, took portions of this from the book of Isaiah, the Old Testament book of Isaiah, and he talks about wearing the armor of God. So let's pick up in verse number 10. He says, finally, this is the end of the book, the end of the letter. So he said, I'm getting to the last part. I'm giving you some important stuff. So listen up. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. One of the great mistakes that we make as believers is thinking that we must stand in our own strength. You're not going to conquer sin in your own strength. You're not going to live a life of grace in your own strength. You're not going to love people that you normally would not love in your own strength. You must stand in the strength of Jesus. And that's where our strength truly comes from. He said, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. He's got some schemes. he's, He's got some ways he wants to trick you. He's got a whole bunch of lies he wants to tell you. Don't fall for the schemes of the devil. He says, and then he he clarifies this for us. He said, he's talking about standing. This is a spiritual battle. He says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, in other words, against humans, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. In other words, this is a spiritual battle that we're facing. Therefore, because of that, because this is a spiritual battle, because you cannot stand in your own strength, because God has called you to stand firm, therefore, he says, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore. Anybody picking up a theme here? He's saying to stand to be strong, stand strong, stand firm. Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and that is not self-righteousness by the way, that is the righteousness of Jesus. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us today to learn from your Word how to stand. I pray for our fathers and our mothers. I pray for our families. I pray that the believers in this church would stand strong. I pray that you'd anoint our dads. Thank you for fathers. Thank you for our dads today. God, we want you to know that we love you. Show us from the word of God what you want us to learn today. Lord, for those that may be here today or watching online that don't know Jesus as their savior, may this be the day that they receive him. For those that have already become followers of Christ. Lord, speak to us from the Word of God. Show us what we need to change. Show us the beauty of Jesus. Show us the beauty of your grace. And we'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I just want to give you three thoughts, very simple, very quick, uh, today about standing strong as a dad or as a man. First thing is this, stand strong. That's the title of the message, stand strong strong. We want you to stand strong. We want you to be strong. We want you to persevere. Paul wrote, and um, this is uh, actually in several different verses, verses 10 and 11, verses 13, verse 14. He says to be strong. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Now, let me break that down for you a little bit. The words there, be strong, actually Uh, In the Greek language, it means to be able to become able to do something. 
to become able to do something. So if you're going to be strong, you got to develop skill. That's what he's saying. You're not just going to be strong without working at it. You're not just going to be strong without working out. In the same way that an athlete, if an athlete is going to get faster, stronger, um, and able to compete more effectively, what must that athlete do? They must become able to do something. And the more you work at it, the more able you become. Let me just give you an illustration. Uh, when I was a junior in high school, uh, most of you know that I played basketball in high school and college, and I love basketball. It's my favorite sport. And uh, in high school, in my junior year, we made the state playoffs. We were a small school, but we made the playoffs. And uh, I'll never forget it, as long as I live, uh, we were in a very, very tight game. And down at the end of the game, uh, the, the score was tied, and uh, I got fouled with about three seconds left in the game. And uh, that year, my junior year, I was not a very good free throw shooter. And so I stepped up to the line and I missed the free throws. Now we weren't behind, but there are three seconds left on the clock. Well, as you probably know where this story is headed, uh, I missed the free throw, the opposing team got the rebound and at the buzzer, as the buzzer sounded, they made a basket and we lost. Man, I was upset over that. But you know, it's one thing to be upset over something. It's another thing to become able to do something. And even though I was one of the worst free throw shooters on the team my junior year, I'd made a determination. I'd read where some guys would practice and shoot 100 free throws a day. And I determined that over the next year that I was going to shoot 100 free throws every day. And I did that for the next year. And my senior year, uh, not only did I become the best free throw shooter on the team, um, I, we actually won the state championship that year. Now, why would I tell you that story? Because that is, illustrates exactly what it means, what God is telling us to do to be strong. Dads, listen to me. You got to become able to do something. In other words, what you must do is you got to work at it. You got to practice it. It's not just going to happen by accident. If you say, well, I'm just going to go to church occasionally, it's not going to be a priority in our family. We'll go if we feel like it. You're not going to become strong. You must develop discipline and habits and practice getting better. And guess what? You may not think you're very good at it, but the more you practice it, the stronger you're going to become, the better you're going to get, and God's going to get glory out of your life. We must stand in the strength of Christ, not in our own strength. I love what Solomon wrote in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. He said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Don't depend on yourself, but rather, he said, seek his will and all you do, and he will show you what path to take. In, in some translations, it reads that he will make your paths straight. He'll bless you. He'll direct you. He'll guide you. Uh, the Bible tells us to put on the whole armor of God that we might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So you've got to be aware of the devil's schemes. It's not okay to stick your head in the sand and ignore what's going on around you, around your kids, around your family. I realize that um, we live in a culture that is, particularly with social media, that there's so much stuff there out there immediately, so quickly, and a lot of times it's not even true. And so we've got to be aware of that. So I'm not suggesting become a news junkie. What I am saying is you've got to be aware of the schemes of the devil because if you don't, be, if you're not aware, then you won't be able to stand strong. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9 says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Now, I have read that a lion that when a lion is hunting, it doesn't roar because he's sneaking up on something. He's in attack mode. A roaring lion, you know what a roaring lion's doing? He's just trying to take territory, that's all he's doing. He's trying to announce to all the other lions and all the other animals, 
I am the king of the beasts. I am here. I am in charge. This is my territory, and you're not going to mess with it. That's all that a lion that roars is doing. And I want you to listen to what Paul was writing, or Peter rather was writing here. He says that you've got to be aware because the devil is going to try to intimidate you. He's going to try to take territory in your life, but don't you dare give it up. Don't you dare let him have it. That's what he's saying. So we can't let the devil have territory in our life. We've got to resist him standing in our faith. And when we do that, God says that we will be blessed and we will be strong. James 4, 7 says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Flee from you. Um, And I love the verses that we read a moment ago. It says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God. That, the words take up, it means continuous action. In other words, you don't just do it one time. When you get saved, you do it once. You receive Christ, you become born again, you get introduced into the family of God. God regenerates you, he gives you new life. But taking up the armor of God is something you've gotta do on a continuous basis, not just a one-time thing. If you take on the whole armor of God today, guess what you gotta do tomorrow? You gotta take on the whole armor of God. And guess what you got to do next week? You got to take on the whole armor of God. It's continuous action. And so we must stand by wearing God's armor. So the first thing we do is stand strong. Here's the second thing we do. We fight right. In other words, in the right way. You fight in the right way. Uh, Verse 12, it says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We've got to fight a spiritual battle. I I love what it says in 2 uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, 3. But the Lord is faithful. Can I get an amen right there? I mean, the Lord is faithful. No matter how you and I may trip up and fall, the Lord is faithful. He's always there. He's always with us. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. So do you get the picture here? God promises to guard you, but he also invites us into the process. When he saves us, that's all him. He does that because we pray because he loves us because he knew us before the foundation of the world uh he he saves us and it's all his doing it's not my works it's his finished work on the cross but when it comes to taking up the armor of god he promises to protect me but he says you got to get in a position you got to put on the armor you got to make sure that you do your part and so we must fight right how do we fight we fight through the power of the holy spirit we fight with the armor of God. And then finally, here's the, th- the third and final thing. You gotta gear up. You gotta stand strong. You gotta fight right. And you gotta gear up. You know, if you hunt or fish or play golf or some other sport, or if you're a gamer or if you love working on cars, there's one thing you've got to do if you're gonna be successful in any of these endeavors. You got to have the right gear. And I used to love to play golf Uh, until I just figured out how expensive of a hobby that was and how much time it took, you know. I was never very good, but I put a lot of money into the gear, and even though I wasn't good, I looked good while I was out there, you know. And that was kind of my philosophy of playing golf. I may not be good, but at least I can look good. Well, you know what? Um, It's one thing to be able to have the gear. It's another thing to be able to use the gear. And the gear that God gives us, all of us can use. No matter what, when you get the right gear, it makes all the difference in the world. One time I tried to play the mechanic, and I've done that over time, over in the past, and I'm not a mechanic. I know where to put the gas in, I know where to put the key in, and I know a few things, but not much. But I was determined that I was going to um, do this tune-up on my car, even though I didn't know how to do it very much. Uh, So I was changing the spark plugs in my car, and at the time, I had a Ford Expedition, uh, drove that car for 11 years, put 300,000 miles on it, loved it, 
uh, but I did not want to pay the money uh, that the Ford place was going to charge me to do a tune-up, basically, which was change the spark plugs. So I said, okay, I'm going to do this myself. So I got out of my driveway. I got my tools out. I only had some basic tools. I did not have the right tools to work on the car. And the first six, it was an eight-cylinder eight engine, the first six were easy to get to because they're right there, and I was able to change those. But the back two were a nightmare. I didn't have the right tools. And I've got to be honest, I skinned my knuckles, I hurt my hands. It took me about two hours to try to get those stupid spark plugs out of the back, and I could not do it. You know why? I didn't have the right gear. I got so frustrated, I got in, my, got in the vehicle, I drove to the mechanic, and I said, I've changed six of these eight spark plugs. Can you change the last two? He said, no problem. Pulled my car in, and it literally took him 10 minutes. Now, what was the difference? Was he smarter than me? Well, maybe, I don't know, but I, I, I don't think so. Was he a better person than me? No. You know what the difference was? He had the right gear. He had the right tools. And because he had the right tools, he is able to finish the job. And God has given us the right tools to be able to stand. Even in an evil day, like the Bible tells us that we live in today. Let me just kind of go through the tools, the armor that God gave us, and how that you can gear up. The first bit of armor is truth. He said, uh, fasten on the belt of truth. Jesus said the truth will set you free. You know, we live in a culture that does not like truth. In fact, there are people, there are groups that if you tell truth, then they're, they don't think they're in a safe space anymore. They get offended. They get, uh, they get their snowflakes melted or something. I don't know. But they, they, get, they get in trouble. I know that. And, and look, here's the point. Truth will set you free. Um, the, the words having fastened and having put on in, in that phrase we just read. Now, please do not fall asleep when I say this, okay? I'm going to give you uh, something from the Greek, all right? And I know that most of you are like, oh, I'm already asleep. Just give me 30 seconds, okay? This will make sense to you. Uh, in the Greek language is what the New Testament was written in. Uh, these are Greek aorist middle, they're aorist middle participles. You say, what in the world does that mean? It, it's boring, I know that, but it's very important. It simply means this, that God has done and is already doing this for you and that you are to actively participate in it too. All right, so, so read it with that understanding. Having fastened on the belt of truth. God's already done that for you. He's already provided truth for you. He's already provided a way for you. That's what it means, that God is doing it, but you also have to participate in the process. Does that make sense? So in other words, God says, what he's doing is he's guaranteeing that if you'll try this, if you'll ask him to help you, that he will, because he's already done it, he will give you access to it. Put on truth. You want to be able to deal with the culture we live in today? Wear the belt of truth. But you got to participate in it. And by that, I mean that you got to participate in the Word of God. The Word of God is truth. And the more you wear that and read that, uh, God's already done it. He's already made it available. But you need to participate in it too. The second thing is grace. He said, put on the breastplate of righteousness. The body armor of righteousness. That is the righteousness of Jesus, which illustrates the grace of God. So in other words, if you're going to stand strong as a dad or as a mom, you got to put on the, the, the gear of truth. You got to put on the gear of grace. You got to live with the grace of God. And God promises that he would uh, bless you in that. Notice 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So what God is saying here is this. It's not your effort. Yeah, you need to participate. Yeah, God's not against your participation with his grace. But understand that when I rest in him, he works. When I work, he rests. And see, a lot of Christians get that backwards. They think that 
You got to earn God's favor. You don't. You can't do anything to make him love you any more than he loves you right now. You can't do anything to make him stop loving you as much as he loves you right now. I know that's hard to get sometimes. It's not hard to understand, but it's hard to believe. But in the grace of God, when you put on the righteousness of Jesus, you're acknowledging that it's not my effort. Yes, God, you've invited me to participate in this Christian life. Yes, I need to put on truth. But thank you, Lord, that I can rest in your grace. It is your body armor of grace that protects my heart. God wants you to protect your heart. And it's through Jesus. Third thing you put on is the gospel. He said, share the gospel and stand in the gospel as shoes for your feet having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. God's simply saying that you need to build your life around the gospel. You need to build your life around the understanding that it is the work of Jesus that saves you, not yourself. It is his love, not our effort. Romans 10, 15 says, how can people tell the good news if no one sends them? As scripture says, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who announce the good news. Can I just challenge you dads, moms, listen closely. Make the gospel the center of your home. Make sure your children from a young age are being brought to church, but not just brought to church, but that you participate with them. Have them in our children's ministry. Uh, Thank God, uh, Jesse, he talked about our students. This past weekend, we had a student at the Disciple Now get saved. They gave their life to Jesus Christ. That's what this is about, okay? You've got to participate in the gospel. And every time you invite someone to Avalon Church, and by the way, we should be inviting. Every time you make sure your kids are here, well, we don't want to go. Too bad. We're going today. Be the dad. Be in charge. Okay? And the truth is, when you do that, God says your feet are beautiful because you're sharing the good news. Be a gospel dad. The fourth thing you got to put on is faith. He says, take up the shield of faith in all circumstances. He said, with that, you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Faith is so critically important to our stand, to being able to stand. Then you got to guard your mind. Uh, He says, guard your mind with the helmet of salvation. Um, That word take means that God does this for you and that you also participate in it. So in other words, here's how it works. God does the saving. I don't do any of it. You say, what do I do? You ask, that's it. That's your part, you ask. You trust him by faith. You ask him for the faith, and he'll give you the faith. God blesses those that ask to be saved. He says, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And, and, And folks, listen, it is through faith that we can stand. It is through faith that we're not defeated by the lies of the enemy. It is through our mind being covered with the helmet of salvation that our mind is guarded. The Bible tells us to guard your thoughts, to guard your heart. Out of it are the issues of life. The Bible is filled with verses talking about how that uh, we are to transform our minds with the truth of God, with the power of the Holy Spirit of God in our life. Guard your mind. Here's the thought. A A mind that is guarded by the helmet of salvation thinks differently. I want you to think about that. The helmet of salvation. When you get saved, you know what God expects from you? To think differently than you did before. You look at things differently than you did before. You understand things differently than you did before. Guard your mind. And then we pick up the Bible, the sword of the Spirit. And I want you to understand that the Bible tells us that the Word of God is alive. It's powerful. You read it, it's truth. It will bless you, it will guide you, it will protect you. And then finally, powerful prayer. He said, praying always in the spirit. Powerful prayer. Dads, are you praying for your kids? Are you praying for your marriage? Are you praying that God use you, uses you where you work? Are you praying that God guards your testimony? Are you praying? powerful prayers. You see, he didn't say pray long prayers. Now, if you want to pray long, that's fine. But some of the most effective prayers in the Bible were very short. One of the most effective was when Peter got out of the boat. Jesus was walking on the water. 
And Peter said, if it's really you, Lord, tell me to come to you. And he did. And Peter walked on the water for a little bit. Then he got his eyes off of Jesus and he began to sink. You know what he prayed? Our most gracious and beloving and benevolent heavenly father, thou who are... He didn't pray that. You know what he did? He began to sink. Lord, save me! And you know what Jesus did? He saved him. Powerful prayers. And I challenge you dads, you don't have to pray an hour a day. If you get to where you can do that, that's great. But there is no time frame or time limit given in the Bible as to how long we're to pray. The Bible says we're to pray constantly. We're to pray evening, morning, and at noon. In other words, we're to be in that mindset. We're to be in communication with the Father about our life. But you can pray powerful prayers. Lord, help me. Lord, save my kids. Lord, help me to lead well. Lord, help me to have a good testimony at my job. Lord, help me to be a better husband. Lord, help me to be a better father. Those are powerful prayers. And when you pray them with a sincere heart, God promises to answer your prayers. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our dads, those that are in the room and those that are watching online. I pray that you'd anoint and protect them. I pray that you'd help us to take on the whole armor of God and to stand. Give our men particularly the strength to be a man to act like a biblical man should and to be strong and to stand. God, I pray that you protect our homes. I pray for our children's ministry at Avalon Church that you'd raise up an army of followers of Jesus, children that are going to be saved and learn about Jesus and have their lives changed. I pray for our student ministry, God, that you'd raise up an army of followers of Jesus that would impact their schools that would affect this county and this surrounding areas and the region around us. That many would come to know Jesus because of their powerful testimony. I pray that you'd protect our families. I pray that you'd bless our marriages. I pray that you'd protect the moms. But Lord, I pray particularly today for the dads that they would stand. They would stand strong. They would stand in your strength, not their own. Encourage them. Give them the fresh wind in their sails that they need to go on and to persevere and to stand and to stand firm. Before I finish my prayer, I wonder if there are anybody, if there's anybody that needs to receive Jesus today. If you do, I've got good news. He said, if you'll call on the name of the Lord, he will save you. He did all the work on the cross to pay for your sin to redeem you and he says you pray and ask me and I'll save you and you can pray a prayer something like this those of you watching online the same dear Jesus I believe you're the son of God I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and did everything necessary to save me and to make me new and right now I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins and to save me in Jesus name if you'll pray that prayer if you did I hope you'll take your next step card and mark on there that you pray to receive Christ today. Online, click online there, that button that shows that you pray to receive Christ today. And we'll help you follow up uh, and take your next step. But I wonder today if there are dads that need praying for. I'm going to ask all of our dads, we've already prayed for you, but I, I want to pray over you again. All of our dads, would you stand together, please? All of our dads, stand once again. If you're a dad, stand, stand. S-T-A-N-D. Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? All right, so all the dads stand. Thank you, guys. I want to pray for you. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for our dads and our granddads. Lord, I know that many have young children, and God, give them the the strength to follow you and to have a, a godly home. Protect them from evil. Protect them from the culture that we live in that wants to discourage them. I pray that you'd empower them to live for you. I pray for the granddads, the dads of adult children, that you would empower them as well. Lord, their role has changed, but their importance has not. And Lord, I pray that you bless them and use them in a mighty, mighty way. And Lord, we want you to know that we love you today. We 
thank you for the name of Jesus and all that you've done. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Please take a seat. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.